Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is Vanessa, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, Thank you for having me. It is today over here in LA. It's 1 p.m. over here. Um, But uh, yeah, I'm a real one, and I'm so grateful for the process of the 12 steps and for getting me connected to a God who can solve all my problems. Yeah, my sobriety date is September 9th of 2015, and this was my first real attempt at sobriety, and I have not relapsed. And relapse does not have to be a part of your story. I know it's common for a lot of people, but um, when I got here, which I'll get into in a second, I was beaten into such a state of reasonableness. And I had tried every imaginable remedy known that when they said, get a sponsor, work the steps, trust God, clean house, help others, I said, okay. And I've been able to stay here for the last almost seven years um, because of that. And I'm eternally grateful for this program for giving me this amazing life it's so funny because people always say like oh I have a life beyond my wildest dreams and like my wildest dreams was like endless amounts of money and cocaine so that never makes any sense to me because the thought of being useful happy and whole was just so foreign I didn't that was not a dream for me at all um but yeah so I grew up in a religious household my dad is a pastor and I grew up reciting bible verses and going to church camp every year um youth group ministry I mean the whole thing and we got little awards for saying bible verses every week Um, it was this, it was this whole display. And like I said, my dad was a pastor. So public image was really big. And, uh, you know, me being a kid, uh, with alcoholism running in my family, my mom will have 27 years this year. So, um, you know, she's, that's been very helpful, but, uh, alcoholism runs in my family. And from an early age, I mean, I, I, I grew up with a solution to my problems, but frankly, I just didn't understand it. And I couldn't wrap my head around it. And I thought having faith was super cool. Like, that's awesome. You believe in something, but to depend and rely on this thing that you can't see to take care of all of your needs, that was weird. I thought that was super weird that you were going to, you know, pray and this thing was going to take care of you. And for me, what ended up happening is I tried to rely on this power and I thought this power had failed me. And I took my will back and I started to say, you know what, I got this. And it wasn't that my higher power failed me. It's that I failed to align my actions with what I was praying about and what I was trying to believe in, right? I thought um, a higher power was like a magical wand that I could wave around and be like, make me feel better. I'm going to keep living the life I want to live, but make me feel better and like not have to do any work around it. And I turned my back on, on all of that really quickly. And uh, I also had a really difficult time managing my emotions. I couldn't identify them. I couldn't describe them. I couldn't explain them. If I was going to be, if I was sad, I thought I was going to be sad forever. If I was angry. I thought I was going to be angry forever. Everything felt permanent. Nothing felt temporary. And, um, you know, I felt being placed in a powerless position, especially dealing with my emotions. When, when you're placed in a powerless position, wanting power for too long, eventually you reclaim power. And that's just what happens. My parents were very strict, very rigid. I didn't even hear Eminem until I was like 18 years old. Like I was, I really grew up in a box and my parents did that a lot because they were trying to protect me from becoming like my mother and little did they know they put me in a box and I became exactly that. Um, And my whole thing is like overprotective parents breed the best liars. You know, I didn't really have the space to grow and develop. And so there was all these different factors, but the one factor I do want to touch on is that at my core, I am restless, irritable, and discontent. I'm constantly dissatisfied with my existence, no matter what, what material things I have, what money I have, no matter who's in my life, what friends I have, I'm constantly having this internal dissatisfaction and I'm super self-centered and manipulative to my core. Um, and some examples of this is like, you know, my, my mom and my dad weren't together and my dad and my stepmom raised me at about seven years old. Uh, there was $20 sitting on the table and I thought to myself, my mom is going to come pick me up tonight. My parents don't talk. I'm going to take that $20, tell my mom I got it as allowance from my dad, and then we can spend this money. And since they don't talk, they'll never know if that was a lie or not. And so we took the $20. I think we went to Hello Kitty and bought a bunch of stuff. And then we came back. My dad said, where's the $20? I don't know what you're talking about. Then I got my ass whooped that night. And But that's like a prime example of alcoholism just manifesting in my life because 
at seven years old, I'm creating lies on how to put, you know, put my parents pretty much against each other on how I can be selfish and get what I want and what I want right now. No one taught me that. Right? No one taught me, hey, Vanessa, this is how you lie. This is how you get sneaky. Like that shit was just brewing. And there was another time in, um, I think I was, I don't know, I was like maybe 12 or so. And I had really bad anger problems because I couldn't control or manage my emotions, the main symptom of my alcoholism. And so one day I was stomping up the stairs violently and I freaking kicked a hole through the wall because I was so angry. And you know, when you're a kid and you make a mistake, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that just happened. I can't believe I just did that. So I panicked. And so I ran upstairs and I grabbed a bunch of like Crayola markers and I grabbed like black, blue, green, purple. And I started drawing on my elbow and then I got some water and I like dapped it up and went like this. So it looked kind of faded, right? It looked like a giant bruise. And then I came downstairs and I was like, I fell through the wall. I was walking up the stairs. It was terrible. And I gave her this whole sad story about how I tripped and fell into the wall with my elbow, even though I kicked it out of aggression and anger. And they patched up the hole. And to this day, I go over there for like holidays and stuff. And I see the different color on the wall. And, but that's a prime example, again, of me trying to avoid consequences at all costs. Me and consequences don't get along. If I can take the easy way out, avoid consequences, make my life as easy as possible, I'm going to do that. Um, there was another time in high school where I, <laughs> I got asked to go to prom and I said, yes. And then the principal said, Vanessa, you have way too many tardies. You're not going to be able to go. I'm sorry. And I thought to myself, <laughs> that will never do. You're so silly. And so there was a lot of construction by my house. So I researched, I did this whole research project on how long the construction had been there, why it was interfering with my ability to get to school on time. You know, how many cones were there, why it was so chaotic, how far I lived from school, how long it could take me to get there. And pretty much like why this construction was totally in my way and why it's not my fault that I'm late. And so I created this entire essay. I typed it all up. I printed it out and I had 50 of my friends sign it. And then I turned it into the principal and I got to go to prom, right? Like I will find <laughs> whatever way I can to get what I want without avoid, without experiencing any consequences. Um, and there was another time in high school where I was too, I was too, I was kicking heroin and I was too dope sick to go to my finals. And so instead of, you know, accepting those consequences, I stayed at home and I created and photoshopped an entire fake arrest warrant with a judge's signature and everything. I spent hours on this document. I still have it. It looks pretty legit. And, um, and I, I printed it out and I took it to my teacher with this long, sad story about how I'm dating this dude. And I didn't know he was a drug dealer and our house got raided over the weekend. And it was terrible. And this whole experience with my fake tears that I weren't, that I wasn't sad about. And I just gave her this really long, sad story. And then she let me retake my final. And then I graduated college. Like, I'm, I'm trying to paint you a picture of like what alcoholism looks like, right? Because obviously it manifests in my, in my drinking and using, but it manifests in my behavior and my thoughts first and foremost, right? Um, and it's just this really selfish, self-centered approach on how I can get what I want whenever I want it and pretty much how life can cater to me in the easiest ways possible. Even when it came to getting a job, you know, I always went through a friend because I don't want to have to work hard to get my own job. I got a friend hookup. Or I would purposely work at restaurants where I could just flip my hair and be like, hello, I'm here for a job and then easily get it. Like anything that required me to do any work, I didn't want to do. <laughs> Easy way out 24 seven all the time. And so um, I began abusing, you know, a variety of substances and um, I don't drink because it tastes good. i am be real with you. I drink to get fucked up right? Because I like the effects that are produced by alcohol and drugs. I don't do this to socialize. I don't do this because, you know, I want to try every IPA out there and taste different alcohol contents. Like that's no, I drink to get fucked up because I need to escape my reality. I don't like how I'm existing in this world and I need to alter my state. And in the big book, it talks about how we can't differentiate the true from the false and that our alcoholic life seems to be the only normal one. And so what happens is like my natural state, like I said, is restless, irritable, and discontent, constantly dissatisfied. Nothing's ever good enough, selfish, self-centered, you know, and what happens is I drink and I use and I, all of that changes. I feel a part of, I feel loved. I feel accepted. I feel confident. I feel on top of the world. I feel like I can accomplish anything. I all of a sudden have friends. I feel right. All of these, I feel normal really. And I, all of these changes start happening. And so 
I could choose now at this point, I get to either be completely miserable as myself, sober, or I can continue to escape my reality through drugs and alcohol every single day. I'm going to pick this. This is such a better option for me. But what happens is I do this so repeatedly that I start to believe the way that this makes me feel is normal. And what happens is this is why when we get sober, um, we end up we're so depressed and we're sad and we're anxious and miserable. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, why am I like this? And jokes on me because this is actually who I am the whole time. And drugs and alcohol have just been this band aid um, that's altered my reality. And I also learned something interesting about selfishness. I mean, they talk, they'll talk about that a lot in AA for those of you who are new of that selfishness and self-centeredness is actually the root of my problems. And I always thought selfishness was like this egotistical, like I'm the shit, I run everything, I'm the best. But selfishness and self-centeredness can also be like, everything everyone does is a direct reflection of me and my worth, right? Everything bad that happens in life is my fault. If something's, if somebody else is going through something, it must be because of me, right? We have this weird dynamic in our mind where everything is a direct reflection of us and our behaviors as well. So it could be the egotistical side, or it could be the complete self-pity side as well. Fun fact. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I, I drink for the effects produced by alcohol. I use for the effects produced by drugs. And I'm constantly seeking this. And a main reason why I continued to get loaded is because it helped me manage my emotions, right? Talks about in the big book that one of the uh, symptoms of unmanageability is that we couldn't control our emotional natures. And the nature of emotions is that they change. And I don't like that. I don't like change. I don't like the unknown. I want everything to be consistent 24 seven. If I can make every single day of my life the exact same, then I don't have to expect anything different. I don't have to change and I don't have to operate in any other place than where I want to. And so every day I'm, I'm using different substances to try to control how I want to feel, right? Everyone goes through emotions and they have the ebbs and flows of life, sad, happy, glad, whatever. And for me, if I was sad, I'd say that that will never do. I need to be happy. So I need to get loaded. Right. Or if I was way too here, then I need to go here. And everything was just this constant um, <laughs> formula on a day-to-day -day basis of how I can manage and control my existence uh, in the ways that I want to. And, you know, I started out with a lot of fun, I would say like fun party substances. And eventually over time, you know, I had a lot of delusions around certain substances that I was going to, you know, and in all reality, I thought I was going to be 80 years old, racking out lines of cocaine on a coffee table until the day that I died. I really thought that was going to be sustainable for me. There was a lot of delusions there. And so I know this is AA, but I just, I need to share my experience for the, for the sole purpose of the hopelessness and the bottom that I hit. But I'm very grateful for the heroin for entering my life because it forced me to hit a bottom really, really fast. And it caused me to really experience powerlessness and unmanageability in ways that I had never experienced before, right? This is where the broken promise just started to kick in of, okay, I'm not going to do this this time. I'm not going to do this this time. I really don't want to do this anymore. And it was like almost every other week I would blink and I'd be loaded and I couldn't understand why. And, uh, I spent a lot of time trying to control and enjoy my drinking and using. And they talk about it in the big book that it's this great obsession of every abnormal drinker that somehow someday I can manage and control my drinking. And it's a delusion and it's this obsession that makes no sense, right? Because control for me is a few mimosas on a Sunday brunch with my friends, right? Enjoy is the complete obliteration of my entire existence, right? Where I am not, I'm not dead, but I'm not here. Like that's, that's enjoyment for me. And so the thought that I could somehow have both at the same time, it's something that doesn't actually work, but yet we chase this into the gates of insanity or death, trying to make these two things work. And, um, I tried a variety of methods to stop once I finally realized that I might kind of sort of have a problem. I was one of those people. I'm a, I'm a very type five alcoholic, entirely normal in every respect, except for the effect alcohol has upon them where, I can, ever, and pretty much, and this is why alcoholism is so crazy, because in every other area of my life, I'm pretty, pretty good. Like, I can get a 4.0, I can, like, I can get a job, I can hold friendships, relationships, all of that stuff, but ask me to not drink for a day, and I have absolutely no power. I can't seem to do that. And a lot of the times, I think, um, I got, a lot of the times I would get confused, right? My outside life looked so normal, so why can't I handle this as well, right? If I can graduate college, why can't I stop drinking for a day? Like those things just didn't make any sense to me. So once I finally started to realize that those external things did not 
um, create an internal reality for me. I had to start trying to figure out a way to make this work. And so in the big book, it gives us a lot of different options, right? They talk about taking a trip, not taking a trip, switching from scotch to brandy, swearing off forever with and without a solemn oath, right? They give us all of these things, all these methods we have tried in order to make this work. And so I tried all of those along with not just the negative ones, right? The, the ones that they talk about in the book, but also like positive ones. Like I thought if I majored in psychology, I could figure out everything that was wrong with me and then I would stop drinking and using. I also thought if I got a personal trainer and worked out every day that I could somehow like kick, like kickstart myself into a healthier mode of living. Or maybe if I had a smoothie every morning, I could change the dopamine receptors in my brain. I thought if I got inspirational quotes and text and email sent to my phone, that that would somehow be enough to make me stop. Like, <laughs> um, I also, I mean, I changed boyfriends. I changed friends. I moved cities. Uh, I deleted my iCloud. That's a real commitment right there. Not just get a new phone, delete the iCloud. Um, I would get a new phone. I would change phone numbers. I would block people's numbers. I would work in different places. I thought maybe if I worked a lot more, maybe if I had more money, I mean, for, for pretty much like four years straight, once I realized I had a problem, I tried to really make this work. <laughs> I really wanted this to work, right? Where I could continue to escape my reality on a daily basis without suffering any consequences. And in the big book, it says like, this is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it, this utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish. And that's what makes me a real one, right? The need to be sober is I'm going to die, right? And the wish to be sober is like, God, it'd be nice to smile or laugh for once in my life. You know, it'd be nice to like, want to be here and exist and have fun like all these normal people do. And no matter what reasons I give myself as to why I need to stay sober, or want to stay sober, it will not stop me from getting loaded, right? Because this isn't a program for people who want to or who need to or are going to die. It's for people who are actually willing to put in the work to make some changes and, and get better. Again, something I was never willing to do until I entered the rooms of recovery. So I tried this for a really long time and eventually I spiraled out of control. And I think I really believe that God hand tailors our bottoms to us or a higher power, whatever it is, spirit of the universe, energy, love, whatever it is that you believe in. I really think our bottoms are hand tailored to us in a way that's going to make us wake up the way that we need to. Right. So a lot of people come into the rooms of recovery and they say, wow, I wasn't as bad as that guy. Like that guy, woo, they're crazy. Or gosh, I'm the worst one here. My story is terrible. I've really been through some shit. And all of these things are hand tailored to us specifically, right? There are some people out there who need to spend 20 years in prison to realize, holy shit, I think I have a problem and I need help, right? Some people have to get their children removed from their home with multiple CPS or D DCFS cases to be like, oh my gosh, I have a problem with drugs and alcohol. I need to get help. Some people lose the career of their dreams and they're like, that's enough for me. I need to get help. Some people have to be homeless for 10 years, pushing a shopping cart down the street to be like, wow, I really need some help. So all of these things are, are tailored to us in a way that's going to make us wake up, right? And so for me, my bottom was emotional. You know, it was like the reason why I ended up deciding to get help and the reason why I could no longer go on is because I literally could not do this anymore. And it's that saying of like being tired of sick. It was this every day was the same day forever. And it was this constant quest of how I'm going to escape my reality today. And when it comes to substances, it's a very long, tedious process in order to get loaded. You know, I got to find money. I got to find people. I got to drive here. I got to drive there. They change the location a hundred times because they're all sketched out. It's this whole process every day. Sometimes it takes hours for me to just get loaded. And I put myself in dangerous situations in order to do this. Another crazy thing I would do is I would be completely willing to ruin my reputation for the sake of one more time. If I, if my dealer didn't text me back fast enough, I would start hitting up random people, right? Like some kid I sat next to in science class in like sixth grade, no shame, just hit him up like, Hey, do you know where I can find any crap? And I'm willing to just ruin my reputation for the sake of getting loaded just one more time. Right? And so I do all of these things. It's this whole mission every day. And I finally get loaded and I put these substances in my body and then I feel good for about three seconds. And then I have to think about how I'm going to do this all over again every single day for the rest of my life until the day that I die. Monday, Tuesday, Christmas, my birthday, Thanksgiving, Mother's Day, every day is exactly the same of this constant effort of me trying to escape my reality because I can't live in my skin anymore and I hate myself. And, I, and that process became so draining to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. I really can't. I didn't have to lose a lot of things materialistically, but that internal defeat 
like Bill Wilson talks about, like quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. Like, like I've reached those places, right? And so I decided that, I, you know, I needed to get some help. And so uh, I went to treatment and I'm grateful because, you know, I, I told my mom I would go to IOP, but God dressed up as a man in that IOP because in my mind, I'm like, who's the hottest guy in this room? I'm going to find you. We're going to get loaded together. We're going to run away. It's going to be this amazing thing. And I can continue to get loaded. Um, but instead God used this person somehow possessed his body. And this man who I was trying to get loaded with said, you really need some help. You should probably go, go to treatment and get some help. And that's because God knows that I only listen to men and drugs and alcohol at the time. So God used this person as a tool to get me into treatment. And I told him, I was like, I'll be back for you. I'm only going for 14 days. And I was in there for like 77 days or something. But uh, I went to an all women's facility. It was the best thing for me. And uh, I was able to develop some real friendships. And most, first and foremost, I was able to hear about a real solution that, that could be permanent and that could remove this problem of alcoholism that I had been suffering with for years. And so when I got there, like I said, they said, get a sponsor, work the steps, trust God, clean house, help others. And I was so defeated and so broken. And I tried every imaginable remedy possible. And I was so convinced that my way did not work. Right. And I tried just smoking weed. I tried just drinking. I mean, I tried everything possible for me to make this work, burned out every friend, every enabler I had to the point where they said these things. And I couldn't, I couldn't help but just sit there and be like, okay, okay, you got it. And so I got a sponsor and I started going through this work. I finished my steps the first time at about six months. Um, and then I've continued to work my steps since then. I'm, I'm a firm believer that like the steps should be worked more than one time because the facts surrounding my life and who I am as a person, they shift and change as I grow and develop with my higher power. So the facts that at once brought me here are not the facts that my life can stay built on, right? Like the fact when I got here, my parents were the enemy. They were terrible. They hated me. They put me in a box. They locked me up. They never wanted me to thrive or succeed. The fact today is that I was very defiant. I was suffering from alcoholism. I didn't want to listen to anybody. And uh, they did the best that they could with what they knew, right? But if I didn't continue to do the steps or do inventory, I'd still be living my life on the fact of who I thought my parents once were, right? So I've worked my steps multiple times since then. And um, I, when I first opened the book and I started reading step one and I got into the doctor's opinion, um, and I got to the doctor's opinion and I started going through this process, looked at there as a solution. I was so encaptured by what the big book had talked about because it finally gave me some freaking answers really to my problems. I couldn't, I really, after a time, I started to think there's something wrong with me. Like, I really just thought maybe I'm stupid, you know, <laughs> or there's something wrong because I, I couldn't figure out why I continued to burn my life to the ground. And then I get into the book and I realize that I have this hopeless, fatal condition called alcoholism, where my will doesn't really have any factor involved at all, that I'm completely powerless and my life is unmanageable. And so I start looking at this and it talks about us having this obsession. And this obsession is this thought that overrules all rational thoughts, this thought that, um, yeah, a thought that overrules all rational thoughts. So the rational thought of Vanessa, if you get behind the wheel tonight and drunk, drunk and you decide to drive you could kill someone no thought the obsession says it's okay take the side streets everything's going to be okay you're invincible right the rational thought if if i get loaded one more time my mom's going to kick me out of this house um sorry someone keeps calling me my mom's going to kick me out of this house my the obsession says it's okay just get loaded behind her back she'll never find out the rational thought of gosh i should really go to bed tonight i have work in the morning Rash, my obsession says, it's okay, you'll figure it out, everything's going to be fine, right? So I have this obsession that will constantly overrule any rational thought that I have. And this is why the love of children or the love of family is not enough to stop me, right? My mom could have stood in front of the door and said, Vanessa, you're not leaving this house to get loaded, and I would have kicked your ass down to go get high. That's just how the nature of this disease works. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. And uh, so from this place, I decided to get loaded. And not really a choice, but I have to get loaded because when it calls, I have to answer. And I activate this thing called an allergy. And basically, um, basically, it's this abnormal reaction to drugs and alcohol. And my abnormal reaction is that I cannot stop once I start. And this is what differentiates us from normal people, right? Normal people have this idea of control where they can literally have one and put it down and not touch it again for another year. 
because they're just doing it for whatever reasons they do. I'm doing it because I need it. Like I, re- I really feel like I can't survive without these things. And so similarly to the same way that someone is allergic to strawberries, right? They break out in hives, they need an EpiPen, whatever it is, they can't breathe, their tongue swells up, whatever that looks like. For the rest of their life, they can't safely eat strawberries. They could become a doctor, get a PhD in nutrition. They could um, you know, become in the best physical condition of their entire life. And no matter what they do, no matter how amazing their life gets, they will always be allergic to strawberries. And it's very similar with how alcoholism works, right? No matter how big and beautiful and wonderful my life gets, no matter how healthy I get, how strong I get, I will always have an abnormal reaction to drugs and alcohol. And so I activate this thing where once I start, I can't stop. And I also activate a phenomenon of craving, which is this overwhelming and unexplainable desire to do more. And when I look back on my experiences, I've never done half of anything ever. I've never, ever, never, ever done half of anything. I've never, you know, drank, put forward half a beer, like drank a beer and then only drank half and then walked away. I've never wrapped out half a line. I've never done half of anything. Um, and it's because I constantly suffer from this idea of like, I need more. Um, and from this, I go, so from the obsession, the allergy, and the phenomenon of craving, I go on a run, a binge, a bender, whatever it is you want to call it. And I obviously start to suffer some consequences. And I talked about some of the internal consequences that I suffered, but there's obviously a lot of external consequences too, right? Family stops talking to you. You start losing friends, you know, homeless, you lose your job. There's DUIs, there's CPS cases, there's you know, health problems, health conditions, you know, uh, domestic violence, there's thousands of consequences that begin to happen internally and externally. And then I get this grand idea after suffering for so long. Oh, my gosh, I think I should stop, right? You get this brilliant idea, wow, I should really stop. And I do stop. This is the crazy part, I do stop. And it might be for a few hours that I have enough ability to stop. Maybe I can stop for a week, maybe a month, maybe a few months, maybe a whole ass year. And some people, they can stay stopped for a, for a grip of time, eight, nine, 10, 15 years, which we've seen it happen, right? And the problem is, is that this is why drugs and alcohol are not the problem, because from a completely sane and sober state, I convince myself that I should somehow do this all over again. Right. And it's because with alcoholism and with the disease of addiction, I suffer from a lot of defense mechanisms, right? Minimization, justification, rationalization, denial. And what happens is this is why they call us insane, because there's no way that I could hold up a paper, blank paper, with all of my consequences listed on it. And this is what we do. We go, yes, absolutely. I would love to do that again. And it's because our brain decides to distort the truth just enough for us to get loaded again. And what I start doing is I'm completely sober. I start telling myself things like, I'll just use once. It'll only be for the weekend. No one will ever know. I'll just drink, you know, a little bit and it won't like, I'll just have a few beers, right? What's, what's that going to do? That's not going to hurt. Um, I could just smoke weed, you know, like that's legal in California. It's fine. Right. Um, and I start telling myself all of these little excuses and all these reasons, oh, it helps my anxiety. Like I need this, you know, no one's going to care anyway. No one loves me, whatever it is that it looks like. And once all of those thoughts start to kick in, I'm right back to having this massive obsession that no other rational thought is going to defeat. Right. And this is the hopeless cycle of addiction. And it continues and continues until we end up seeking help or we die or we end up in jail or prison for the rest of our life. And so these are all the things that I'm learning as I'm going through step one, and I'm learning about my powerless and my unanswerability, and this should just hook me in because I couldn't figure out for the longest time why I'm like this. And it's so insane because addiction is a fatal progressive chronic illness that we suffer from. It's a really hopeless condition, like addiction equals death. That's usually the outcome for us. And it's crazy because if someone said that I had cancer, I'm like rushing to the hospital to get chemo because I really don't want to die. And someone tells me I have HIV, I'm rushing to the hospital to get treatment because I don't want to develop AIDS and die. Someone says, hey, you suffer from the fatal disease of addiction. I'm like, cool. Can you get me some cocaine? Like that makes no fucking sense, but it's the only disease that tells us we don't have one. Right. Cause my brain is selective and it only likes to remember certain things, uh, that benefit the, the disease. So then I look at the concept of step two, where I come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity And this is where, you know, I suffer from a super hopeless condition, but can I come to believe that something greater than substances, because it must be greater than that. My, my deep desire and need for substances, it must be greater than that. 
could somehow fix this problem or that my life could somehow get better. And we just need a little tiny bit of hope in order to do that. And, and a really big reason I like to, a big way that I like to see this happening is through this idea of God shots. And I'm sure some of you have heard of it, but it's just this really unexplainable things that start to happen as we grow and develop in sobriety that are just a little too coincidental, a little too not caused by us. And maybe something supernatural, maybe it's like a God or a higher power that's working in my life. And so I usually have sponsees write down um, every time they've seen a higher power work in their life. And it could be something as simple as, you know, they're super broke and they found $5 on the ground and they really needed it. Or maybe they were thinking about someone who they haven't talked to in years. And then that person somehow calls, you know, um, I remember one time I was skating uh, to the train and there was this homeless kid on the side of the road and I sat down and talked to him. Uh, it was like four months sober. Times were tough. I was in sober living. It was terrible. I had no money to my name and it was this kid's birthday and I had about four cigarettes left. And I said, you know what? This kid needs these way more than I do. Like I'll figure it out. Like I was so broke. Um, but I gave him my cigarettes and then I get on the train and I walk all the way to the back and on the back, the last seat at the back where I went to go sit down, there was a fresh unopened pack of cigarettes sitting there. And I asked everyone, I said, are these yours? Are these yours? Are these yours? They're like, no, we don't smoke. Like, what are the chances of that? Tell me. What are the chances of that? It's weird, right? And there's little moments like that that happen all over sobriety. And so when I start to look at these things, because it's like, if I told all of you to close your eyes right now, and I said, on the count of three, I want you to open them. And I want you to look for everything that's yellow. Ready? One, two, three, go. Close your eyes. And I say, what was everything that was blue? And be like, oh shit, I wasn't looking for blue. I was looking for yellow. And that's literally how a higher power works, right? If I'm not looking for this higher power, if I'm not seeking out this type of God or this thing in my life, I'm just not going to see it, right? I have to direct my attention to these things. And so once I do this enough, it makes it really easy to transition into step three, where I get to turn my will and my life over to this thing, right? Because I'm watching this thing work in my life now that I'm trying to pay attention to it. And uh, step three is, where we turn our will and our life over to the care of this um, God, higher power, energy, universe, whatever it is that you call it, uh, as we understand it. And this is where I start to see that selfishness is the root of my problems and that everything I do in life usually has a selfish or ulterior motive, right? I'm usually a self-seeker, even when trying to be kind. And like I said, in my natural state, I'm driven by a hundred different forms of fear, self-pity, dishonesty, self-seeking, self-serving behavior. And it's like, I'm driving blindly through life like this. And I just hurt hella people in my path because I can't see because I'm driven by myself. And so I hurt all these people. They hurt me back because I hurt them. And then I'm upset that they hurt me. When in reality, I've placed myself in positions to be hurt. Everything I've ever done in my life has always been self-imposed. There are some moments that have come through that were not caused directly by me. But most of the times I placed myself in many positions to be hurt. And I blame everyone else, but it's really me. And uh, I get to pretty much make it so that I'm no longer the one driving, that God gets to be my director, that God gets to finally run my life. Kind of like I have a new employer, right? When I when you get a new boss, you kind of, you do what they say, right? Because you want to remain employed. And that's kind of the same thing. I kind of try to do what this higher power tells me to do because I want a better life. Um, and it gives us this prayer in the big book. It has a lot of these and thous and it's a uh, very old and it worked for me for a really long time. And then I just started to have it keep it real simple of just, you know, God, I'm making a decision to turn my will and my life over to you. Amen. And then I can just let God be God. And I get to see what God does with that really simple prayer. Cause I started telling God what to do in my prayers. I'd be like, okay, God, like, can you replace this with this? And I'm really looking for patience in this area. And if you could give me that over there, that would be really cool. And I really specifically need help with this, but Right. So I'm telling God how to be God in my prayers, which completely defeats the purpose of step three. Um, and then we look at step four, which is where we get to write this wonderful inventory, which is my favorite step of all time. And it's because it's the step that gave me real clarity and real emotional balance, right? Real emotional neutrality. Um, because when I look at resentment inventory, it's anything that has made me angry, hurt, sore, threatened, or upset. I always thought resentment was seething, rage, and anger, but it's not. It actually includes hurt. And so when I look at it like that, if I write out a list of all the people who have hurt me in my life, that list is a lot longer than the people who have made me angry. And I get to really look at these things and try to ask myself, if I'm ready to look at these things from an entirely different perspective. Um, and I write out how these people, these things, these principles have hurt me, uh, what these things affect. 
And then it gives us this really amazing prayer, which helps shift me out of this victimizing self-pity role that I played a majority of my life, right? The easy way out that nothing is my fault and it's everyone else's problem. And it gives me this prayer. And I'll use my dad as an example, but it says, God, please help me show my dad the same tolerance, pity, and patience that I would cheerfully grant a sick friend. My dad is a very sick person. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. I will be done. And what this prayer does is it starts to shift my attention away from uh, from the harm that's being caused into a place of pity, tolerance, and patience that I would cheerfully grant a sick friend. So why is it, right? I always hated when people would walk in and out of a meeting. I'm like, that's so distracting. Either come in or stay out, take your pick, like, or don't be here at all. It was really savage back then. And, but here's the thing. If my best friend was walking in and out of a meeting, I would say, oh, it's probably an emergency. Like maybe she has to call her sponsor. Maybe something really serious is going on. Maybe she's not feeling well. And all of a sudden I have all this pity and compassion when it's my best friend. But when it's a complete stranger, I'm like, get the fuck in or get the fuck out. What is it? Right. And um, so this, this resentment prayer, it starts to neutralize my reactions to people so that everyone in my life I can view as if I would cheerfully grant a sick friend the same views so that the way I treat my boss is the same way I treat my best friend, the same way I treat a newcomer, a complete stranger, somebody that I meet, right? Everyone in my life is treated exactly the same. So now I'm starting to remove that layer of me being an actor and me playing all these different roles in order to be or get what I want. And uh, I can finally actually be one person. So it removes my emotional reactions to these people and allows me to live my life on like a very even plane. That makes sense. Um, I look at where I was selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, and frightened. And at the root of every single resentment is fear. Um, and I really wish fear inventory was like the first thing that we all did in recovery. It's, it's very useful. It's where this solution really lies, but it's broken down. Like, you know, I have a fear. I ask myself why I have this fear. I asked myself, how has self-reliance failed me? And in a better way to put that, what am I relying on that's not God in order to remove this fear, get me out of this fear, make this fear go away? I ask God to remove this fear, and then I direct my attention to what he would have me be. And so let's take the fear of alone for being, the fear of being alone as an example, right? If I have a fear of being alone, why do I have it? You know, it means I'm, I'm unlovable, unworthy, you know, then I'll never be successful in life, whatever all that comes with, you know, no one likes to be lonely, blah, blah, blah. And then I get to this column of how the self-reliance failed me. In other words, what am I relying on that's not God? And when I look at all the people I've relied on in my entire life to make me not feel alone, that's a very long list. If I think about all the things I've relied on in life to not be alone, it's a very long list. All the places I've relied on to not feel alone, that's a long list. What about all the actions I've taken to not be alone? That's very, very long list, right? That changing myself, changing who I am so that you like me, you know, completely altering my life, making right, making all these decisions and changing all these things to not be alone. And then I have these beliefs that I that I hold on to about being alone and ideas that I hold on to about being alone that are preventing me, right? And so I have this giant list of things that I've tried to do my entire life to stop me from being alone. And none of those have worked. And this is why fear inventory is so cool because I'm actually going to get a solution that's going to pull me out of the fear into, into God, pretty much. So I ask God to remove this fear of being alone and I direct my attention to what he would have me be. And a lot of the times in this column, if God would have me be loving and kind and patient, and that's all cool, but like when I'm in crippling fear, if you tell me to be kind, that doesn't help me. I'm sorry, I'm just going to be real. Someone's, if I'm in crippling, terrifying fear, and someone's like, just be kind. Like that does nothing. So <laughs> I have to think more so of like, what would God have me do? I need like a specific set of actions to act my way out of fear and into a solution. So I start to look at things like, you know, why am I alone in the first place? And why is being alone so bad, right? Am I having a hard time sitting with myself? Like I really look at these actions that I can take to grow out of that fear. Super helpful. We also have sex inventory. And this is where um, I get to really address my dynamics in my relationships and not just romantically, but also plutonically with people as well. And I get to ask myself some questions. Um, and it's not a list of people I slept with necessarily. It's a list of anyone I was romantically involved with that I hurt. And that was a longer list, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I asked myself, where was I selfish and considerate, dishonest? Where did I arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where was I at fault and what should I have done instead? And I walk through this whole thing. And when I look at what should I have done instead from a sane and sober place, all of those things that I write down and, and I can't say not gotten involved because that's not the point. It's, it's this idea of like from a sane and sober place, what are the actions and things that I should have been aware of or should have taken 
And I get to compile all those together and those get to be my ideal list. And it's a list of things that I really struggle with that I desperately need God's help with if I plan on having successful relationships in sobriety. Um, I do step five where I basically read this all back to my sponsor and, uh, and it asked me to quietly meditate for an hour where I carefully review what I've done. And it asked me like, have I skimped out on the cement put into the foundation? Like, am I missing shit? Cause if I try to build my foundation on shaky ground and sobriety, my structure is going to fall at the slightest inconvenience, right? Cause when we try to build our sobriety on money or, or success or him or her, the wind blows the wrong way and my structure collapses. But if my cornerstone is firmly rooted in, in God or a higher power, then I get to, uh, pretty much have, you know, the life that I'm really looking for, the life that was really designed for me. And so I sit quietly and I go through what I've, what I've covered so far. And I ask myself if I've completed everything that needed to be completed. And hopefully the answer is yes. And then I look at step six where, um, I basically look at my defects and I become willing to have God, uh, remove these things and remove my shortcomings and help mold me into the person I'm supposed to be. And pretty much when it comes to step six and seven, like God's going to remove what God wants to remove when God wants to remove it. Some of the things that I hate the most about myself, some of the parts of my story that I absolutely dread are actually some of the things that make me the most useful. And this is what people don't understand about recovery is like the more fucked up you are, the more people you're going to help. And so that's actually kind of fascinating because we think we're so isolated and different and we suck, but you're actually going to be the most useful because you have so much experience to offer. And, uh, but only God's going to really know what's useful. So I really have to be in this place when it comes to step six and seven of allowing God to remove these things whenever God sees fit and continuing to, you know, address these things on a daily basis. And um, I have uh, a lot of the times my, you know, they talk about character defects a lot and right, selfishness, self-centeredness, dishonesty, people pleasing, all of these characteristics. And over time, it's not so much the defects that, that get me tripped up today. It's more so, um, it's more so these ideas that hold me back in life, right? Like me, I refuse to allow my dad to be human. Um, my dad, right. My dad was a pastor, right. In church. And in my mind, I created this idea that my dad can do no wrong because he's a pastor and he's amazing. And this idea protected me from a lot of pain from my childhood, because if I didn't believe that my entire foundation of my life would be fucked up. And so I had to really come into step six and seven with this thing of like, am I willing to remove that idea about my father and allow him to be human? And if I'm not willing, why? Right. So that's just like something that, that came up for me a few years ago in regards to like these ideas that hold me back. Um, and then I look at steps eight and nine. So eight is becoming willing to make amends to these people. Um, and amends is not an I'm sorry. It's not like an apology. I mean, you can say you're sorry, but it can't just be like this. Yo, my bad. Like, that's not what we're doing. We're actually like coming into these situations, really making things right with some like constructive actions uh, surrounding the wrongs that I've caused. And so I will tell you that I was willing to make every single amends except the financial ones. I did not want to do that because when you're broke and you're struggling for pretty much your whole life in the midst of addiction and alcoholism, the last thing I want to do is get a job, finally, have some money, finally, and then give it away. Absolutely not. I was so unwilling to do that. And um, so I made all my amends and the financial ones really got me tripped up. And my sponsor is oh so clever. Instead of her being on my ass about making these financial amends, she would just make the tiniest little comments, right? I would show up to the meeting with a Red Bull and she would say, how much is that Red Bull? I'd be like, I don't know, like five, six bucks. She's like, oh, cool. That's money you could have given to your ex's grandma. And she continued to do this every time she saw me to the point where I didn't even want to show up to the meeting with anything in my hands because I'm like, she keeps bothering me that I owe these people money. And so eventually I reached this point where I was like, fine, I'll start paying them. But I thought that, you know, when I owed my grandma, my ex's grandma money, $3,500, that I had to pay that all up front. Just be like, boom, here's your cash, take it. and in reality, that's not, that's not how this is. It's actually the demonstration of paying it back. That's actually the real important part, right? So even if I could only afford $5 a month to pay that $3,500 back, I'm at least demonstrating the amends, if that makes sense. And so I wrote this old, old lady. She's, she had to be like 89 or whatever, but I wrote her and I, I expressed all my wrongs. I admitted them fully. Um, 
and I sent her for, I put $40 in an envelope and I said, you know, I'm in school full time. This is as much as I can offer you until I pay you back. She sends me a letter back with the money inside. And she says, she said, um, my religion teaches me to forgive, but I will never forget. I do not want your money. Please send all the money you owe me to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And that it just twisted the knife in my chest, right? Like I stole $3,500 from this old woman. And not only does she not want that money back, she wants it to go to sick children dying of cancer. Like, oh my gosh, it's just like my heart, like it just really hurt, you know? <laughs> and so now my card's on a reoccurring payment for $40 for St. Jude's every month until it's paid off. But there's sometimes we can make really cool amends and it's not always this dreadful face-to-face -face thing. Like my great grandma, um, she lived on an island over here called Catalina and she passed away. And when I showed up to the funeral, I was really sick. I was not okay. I fell out of my chair. I nodded out on the boat. It was terrible. I was a complete embarrassment to the family. And so I went back there a few years later where I got scuba certified and I painted a rock and I, and I brought it down to the bottom of the ocean and it said, I love you, grandma. I'm so sorry. Right. And like, there's different, really cool, unique ways. Instead of walking up to the dude in Walmart and handing him $500 for the shit I stole, I could donate it to the charities that they work with. That's much more use, more beneficial use of the money than putting it in someone's pocket right so these are all really cool things that i get to do made a lot of amends to ex-boyfriends etc um and then i have step 10 which is 10 is this like constant awareness 24 7 of my behavior and my thoughts and my patterns from steps one through nine right it's tw it's all all the time 24 7 looking at my behavior that when something comes up i face it immediately because i've just cleaned out my whole life i've literally caught myself up to my present moment in sobriety pretty much with a clean slate and i i need to maintain that if i plan on staying sober i can't slip back into the things that i just spent weeks and months looking at and so um when something comes up especially if it's a resentment or a fear or there's an issue i have to look at it immediately or i face the chance of relapsing, getting loaded, or ending up with a really long fourth step, which continued to happen until I learned my lesson. And uh, so I continue to take personal inventory and when I'm wrong, I promptly admit it. And I work in treatment. And so in the treatment industry, there's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of crazy stuff that goes on and mixing business with service and recovery is very, it's a very fine line. So I've been at work and I've literally been like, oh, time to write an inventory. And I literally like busted out an inventory mid shift because that's just what I do in order to maintain my my sanity here. Um, and then when we look at step 11, it says sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And so by the time we get to 11, we've actually always had this, the knowledge of God's will for us. Um, it's, it's within and I mean, for me, it's that it's this feeling in my stomach that tells me this is a bad idea. This doesn't feel right. I shouldn't go here. I need to break up with this person. I'm not okay. This is wrong. Something's happening here, right? But through the midst of my addiction, I continue to push that down and I ignore those things and I continue to suffer consequences. And as I continue to go through the steps, this channel starts to open up where I start to feel guilt and I start to want to listen to this internal voice, right? This voice of God, this voice of reason, a higher power, whatever it is. And so I've always known god's will right we always we all know the power we all know the difference between right and wrong and what's actually good for us the problem is, is we've never had enough power to actually act on those things so step 11 keeps me tapped into this power where i'm now fully aware of what's right and wrong i'm fully aware of where i need to go and who i need to be and what i need to do but do i have enough power to carry it out and so when i look at prayer and meditation it keeps that channel pretty open and it allows me to uh to live in that space which is the space we really want to strive to live in, I think, in sobriety. And uh, I used to think meditation was like sitting in a dark room with a door locked with like incense and candles burning and chakra meditation that's deep and grounding with headphones. And it was this big process. But in reality, it's just anything that improves your conscious contact with a higher power. Um, it could be, you know, being at the ocean, sitting at the beach, talking with a sponsee, being, working with another person, whatever that looks like. And it's really this cool individualized step that we get to have a lot of freedom, spiritual freedom in. Uh, and then we look at step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. Uh, we carried this message to other alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs, tried to. And uh, this is this is like the this is the this is the best part, right? This is like sponsorship. This is where we carry everything into our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. It's real cool to go to a meeting and have a fire share, but like how do you treat your mom? <laughs> right? If you want to know what my program looks like, ask my mom. 
ask my boss, right? Ask these people where I'm carrying this program into my daily affairs. Don't ask my best friend in recovery. Don't ask my sponsee, right? They're all going to say great things, but go ask people that I actually am carrying this with me outside of the rooms of recovery and demonstrating it there. That's like a real demonstration of the program is where I practice and apply these principles. And when it comes to sponsorship, it literally says that this is an insurance policy against getting loaded, right? Nothing will so much ensure immunity uh, from the first drink is intensive work with other alcoholics. And yet people still don't do it. It's literally an insurance policy against getting loaded. And uh, so through this and, and event, and in the beginning, it was like I sponsored because I have to, right? Because it's something that the 12 steps suggest that I have to do this if I plan on staying sober. And eventually it's manifested into this thing that I truly desire to do. That's become a part of my identity. And I absolutely love um, the process of the steps and being of service and and sponsoring people and walking people through this work and helping them get clarity and helping families get reunited, right? We have this really, really unique skill set where we are able to reach people that that no one else really can. And it's such a gift. It doesn't feel like that when you get here, right? You're like, why is this happening to me? Why am I an alcoholic? Why am I a drug addict? This is terrible. But then over time you realize or at least I realized that this has been the most beautiful gift I could have ever been given, right? That I have a design for living that 90% of the population will never have, right? Normal people live with their anger and resentment every single day, 24 seven, and they work their nine to five with their head down half asleep and they go through their life like that. And we have this amazing ability to like help God reach the unreachable, right? We're a very difficult population. We have a lot of crazy stuff that's happened to us and we've used addiction and alcoholism as a coping skill. And for us to be able to be a channel or a vessel to help these people heal, like that's, that's amazing. Like I, when it says like, this is our primary purpose, like I couldn't, I couldn't ask for a better one, right? No matter how chaotic my life gets, no matter how crazy everything gets, no matter, even if I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I don't know where I'm going. I always have a primary purpose and to carry the message to other people who still suffer. So as long as I'm doing that, all the secondary purposes usually have a tendency to align themselves. Um, and I'll show you the story about a sponsor, but this girl called me from a hospital and she had like an infected abscess. It was going to her heart. It was this crazy thing. And she said, Hey, I got your number from somebody. Will you sponsor me? And I said, you know, sure, I don't know you, but I have the time you're asking for help, whatever, I'm down. And so I sat with this girl week after week, and we continued to do the process of the 12 steps. And, you know, within months, uh, this process was working, and it was manifesting in her life. And, you know, she was sponsoring other women, she got custody of her five-year-old son back, she got her own apartment, um, she got a really good career, a good job, and she was thriving, like living her best life. And she takes a cake on Zoom during during COVID. And, you know, we're all like, keep coming back sober. And her son, her five-year-old son is literally like dancing around in a circle, just saying, happy birthday, mommy. Happy birthday, mommy. Happy birthday, mommy. And like, he has no idea what we're doing. But like, I look at that and it's like, dude, what <laughs> makes me so emotional? It's like, well, what if I said no? What if I was so selfish and so self-centered with this beautiful life that God's given me? And I said, oh, I don't have time for that. Like, I'm not God, but like, where would that kid be? You know what I mean? Where, what, what would happen if I really just stopped caring about this process? And I just said, oh, you know, I have four jobs and I'm getting married and my life is too big. And I can't turn around and help the new person that's coming in. Like, we have a gift, you know, and this gift, like, not only helps alcoholics and addicts, like, find a higher power, you can solve all their problems, but like, we're helping families sleep at night, too. You know, it's like this really amazing thing that, I mean, I'm personally like so grateful to be a part of and sponsorship is the one thing that's never stopped my entire sobriety. And, uh, it's a formula that works, right? It's something that works in rough going. It's a design for living. It gives us all these amazing things. And so, um, if I said a lot of things and you're like, what is she talking about? Uh, I encourage you to find out and be a part of this process, especially if you're new what the steps look like, at least for me and how I interpreted them, um, from the work that I've done. And, uh, and then if you've been here for a while and you feel complacent or stuck or you're unhappy, or there's something spiritually wrong, you're not as on fire as you used to be. I also encourage you to get back into the work, right. And, and maybe have a new experience, maybe get a new sponsor because there's these things called big book fairies. And every time I read that book, there's something new in there that I feel like I've never seen before, or at least I'm seeing with a different set of eyes or something new has shown up in, in that book. That's, that's allowed me to become more aligned with God 
and, um, and, and have this new experience, right? Because in reality, there's no reason that anyone should ever be miserable in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous or any other type of anonymous. We have a solution that really, really works. Um, and I encourage you to, to pretty much fuck around and find out and see if your life doesn't improve. So thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.